our final and fourth session in a moment. So please kindly get seated and we continue exploring themes and highlights discussed in the morning via local, national and regional initiatives. This time we will be looking into the experiences and examples of work from Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan and Ukraine and we'll try to provide an overview of the cultural um, and creative sectors in these countries, highlights, priorities and challenges, of course. Now, without further ado, I want to invite our speakers one by one to the stage. Ramil Abak Abakirov, I'm very sorry, Head of Department of Creative Industries and Digital Development, Ministry of Culture of the Republic of Azerbaijan. If you could kindly make it to the stage. Madina Badalova, Head of Education and Inclusive Division at the Art and Culture Development Foundation under the Cabinet Ministers of the Republic of Uzbekistan. <laughs> Kairat Sadvakaso, Deputy Chairman, Kazakh Tourism. And Luisa Moroz, Ministry of Culture and Information Policy of Ukraine. Now this is our final session and if you could please, please, please keep your presentations to utmost 10 minutes so that I won't have to interrupt anyone's great uh, speech here. So why don't we start with Ramil? Please, um, click her. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot. Okay. It's my pleasure to be here today. Could you please pass it? Um, click it. And uh, my name is, as you mentioned, my name is Ramila Bakirov. I'm from the Ministry of Culture um, of the Republic of Azerbaijan. And I'm the state official, as you can see from my outfit and from outfit of today's, now, w w what we have this session. So we are all basically government officials. We are very different in general from creative uh, people, but we are also trying to be creative in our daily work, mostly bureaucratic work. Um, I want to, I decided not to do kind of a presentation, but just to speak uh, and not to prepare a speech. Just to, just, just to speak sincerely what we see from our point of view, uh, from government point of view, and what the challenges, what kind of challenges we face. And to hear from you in terms of, in forms of questions or maybe in forms of advice, how we can solve different kind of challenges that we face uh, in our everyday lives. Uh, basically, uh, so I'm, as I said, I'm from the Ministry of Culture. I'm heading the Department of Creative Industries and Digital Development. And what I see from what I observe uh, in terms of creativity is that it became uh, a modern uh, topic nowadays. But the creativity of people is not something new. This is what we always had, starting from the very beginning of. Uh, of existence of human race. That was the thing, the creativity was the driver of development uh, and creativity was the driver of new achievements, for new achievements that we achieved during the whole history of, our, of the mankind. And now, uh, with the transformation that we face, with, with the huge amount of transformation changes that we face in our world today, uh, the creativity actually is also changing. The forms of creativity that we experience, that we see, are also changing, and that uh, changes our day daily lives. So, the latest changes uh, are uh, in relation with the COVID pandemic, um, changed our life in, in such a short period of time, and so drastically, that we don't believe now that we can participate in kind of face-to-face -face meetings, and that's uh, that became a, not a different habit for us. And uh, so, in this transformational world, in the world that the speed of transformation is accelerating, it's not only the transformation that's happening; its speed is accelerating. What we, as the government, can do to support the creativity of people? Um, so here, I want to. I want to say uh, shortly what we do as the government of Azerbaijan. Uh, we have set 
uh, first time in our history, uh, a strategy paper. Uh, the, the paper uh, is the vision of Azerbaijan for 2030. And uh, within this strategy paper is the first time in our history that we have uh, creative industries as an official term. Um, so uh, it means that the government uh, in our country recognize, recognizes the creative industries as the industry. Um, it is, uh, well, that looks very simple to, to, be, to, to achieve, but actually that was a challenge for us. Um, uh, another, some other achievements that we also had during the, this period of time was the creation of Creative Industries Federation. Uh, we decided that this federation should be uh, out of the government. So it should be not, not a non-government organization. And um, during the short period of time that this federation existed, the head of which is Mr. Vasif is in front of us, uh, the federation achieved a lot of diff like many achievements, many goals, and now they are here with us uh, in order to promote our policy and also in order to network with, with all of these other countries. Um, we also, uh, what, what is uh, the important thing, I think, we also, it was mentioned before by the representative of Kyrgyzstan that the most important thing in terms of development of creative industries is setting up the dialogue between different parties. That is the, that is the major challenge for po many post-Soviet countries because there is a uh, mistrust between the society and the government. That is the challenge that we face, is a lack of trust. And where there is, uh, and if there is no dialogue, this lack of trust is getting even bigger. And what we aim, and what we, I think, partially achieved, is building the dialogue between different, uh, different sides, different uh, players of the creative industries. Um, and what are the challenges? So basically, this is what has to has uh, was, was like achievements that we have during this period of time. But I also want to focus on challenges that we, as the government, as the country, face in this regard. Uh, the big challenge for us is the scale of the market. So when we talk about the creative industries, we are here all together, but we represent different countries. And uh, if, for example, for, the, uh, for such a country as Turkey with around 70, 80 million population. Our country is only 10 million population. And in order for creative industries to be successful, uh, our creative people should not only create, but also adapt to, uh, to uh, bigger markets. Let's say create in English, or create in Turkish, or in other, kind, other languages. Um, that is a major challenge for small countries as Azerbaijan. Uh, and uh, some other challenges also we have uh, with the statistics. Uh, I think statistical uh, data, data, data is very difficult for us to uh, get. Uh, and we do develop mechanisms, but in some cases we normally take the official mechanisms such as the UNESCO CDIS, there is a culture development indicators uh, mechanism, but it's also very difficult to adapt it to local, local st standards, I would say. Um, that's, that's a major, also a big challenge for us. And then, um, you know, uh, also I think it's important to also pinpoint this kind of uh, challenges, like which are maybe not popular to speak about, uh, one of them is, for example, the uh, standard of living of, of, of people. Like, in order to, uh, for people to understand that creativity, their creativity, can, uh, can be beneficial from economic point of view, they need to first solve, in, in many cases, solve the basic problems that they have, like uh, some simple problems of daily living, you know. 
And in many cases, also in Azerbaijan, we had this kind of problem coming from 1990s. We had a huge amount of refugees. And for them, in order to, to think about creativity, the first thing they have to do is think about life, you know, <laughs> to solve the basic needs of life, to, to know where to live, at least. So that's a very, very basic question. I think in, in some other countries, as for example, nowadays we see it in Ukraine. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a very important question, and that's a very big challenge for the country, for the government, to push people uh, to the creativity, but also knowing that in some cases they have a very difficult life. Um, and also I think in many, mostly for Soviet countries, we have the kind of problem which is a business approach to creativity. Um, we have like unbelievably creative people who, who create very beautiful products uh, but cannot sell them. You know, that's a, that's a huge thing because uh, how it, where it comes from? It comes from mostly from uh, Soviet period of time when the creativity was also state or stately owned. Uh, and, now, uh, and then people are now like waiting, thinking about not getting, let's say, international audience, but they are thinking about uh, getting the middle of people, artists from the government, you know, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a very, very big question. Mr. Bakirov, yeah. I don't want to interrupt you, yeah. uh, but I just want to remind you that you're at nine minutes, so you just have a minute <laughs> All right. left. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, uh, basically, this is, this is what I wanted to say, and I will be happy to participate in discussions, but uh, I think that in, in general, in, uh, challenge, in uh, facing the problems of the creativity, we have to ask these very difficult questions and ask them uh, from all the sides of this, uh, of this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Madina Badalova, could you please um, talk us through your experience in Uzbekistan? Thank you very much. Um, yes. Um, well, I represent here the Arts and Culture Development Foundation under the Cabinet of Ministers of Republic of Uzbekistan. Um, thank you all for having us here and to the organizers of this uh, important event. Uh, first of all, I would like to present the Arts and Culture Development Foundation, which is okay. Thank you. Um, we are uh, quite a new entity. We've been launched in 2017 by the initiative of the President of the Republic of Uzbekistan. So as my colleague said, we are the state institution, um, but uh, we also have some philanthropy funding, uh, apart from the government and budgetary funding. Um, our mission has been formed throughout uh, the last five years, depending on the needs of the country. Uh, there are sometimes questions like, uh, sometimes there are questions like, what is the Ministry of Culture and what is the Arts and Culture Development Foundation because you kind of like do the same thing. We do a bit of a different thing. So, um, sorry. So the Arts and Culture Development Foundation was um, launched with the main mission of carrying on the diplomatic relations. Uh, apart from domestic projects, we have a wide range of international projects. So, um, Starting 2017, we've launched big projects in the field of architecture. Uh, so these include the first center of contemporary arts in Uzbekistan, uh, the State's Art Museum, um, um, the architect of which is Tadeo Ando, the uh, famous architect. Uh, also, um, uh, French Cultural Center, uh, artist residencies in the old neighborhoods of uh, Tashkent, and several other um, uh, architectural projects. So uh, abroad, we've been carrying on a bunch of um, uh, big exhibitions. One of them is the first launch of the National Pavilion of Uzbekistan at Venice Biennial in 2021. Uh, so this year we launched our second one and uh, the next ones are upcoming. So the foundation is commissioning the National Pavilion. Also, uh, just a few days ago, we've opened two big exhibitions, one at the Louvre Museum and the other one is in the Institute de Montarab uh, in, in Paris. Um, also, we, um, we work a lot with the 
uh, domestic projects and uh, throughout these years we kind of became the center for supporting and developing new talent, uh, new knowledge and employment opportunities for young artists and in the field of cultural sector as a whole. Uh, we have created the first of its kind uh, laboratory for young students and um, young emerging artists. So the laboratory operates under the Center for Contemporary Arts. Um, we provide uh, different opportunities for emerging artists. It's lectures, workshops, uh, participation in different international events, particularly some of our uh, artists, they participated at the first National Pavilion of Uzbekistan. We do provide them the access to work with very famous curators, so this is kind of the way to support them. And also sometimes we carry on different uh, activities in order to kind of um, um, enhance their skills in, in uh, getting into the international market and understand how they can actually participate at the fairs. So one of the big projects that we are launching soon is the project space for the young artists where they could actually present their works because uh, we've been working many years and we've been participating at different fairs as, a, as an institution just presenting its activities, but starting next year, uh, we want to also represent the artists in the art, international art fairs. Uh, one of the projects that we are very proud of is the launch of um, uh, World Conference on Creative Economy uh, in 2024 in Uzbekistan. That's uh, that's kind of a big initiative that we've been kind of watching and trying to prepare for many years. As we have lots of lots of different projects internationally, we, we do see that this is a way of organic development of the creative industry within the country. So uh, as I usually speak to my colleagues and I understand that uh, there are people who say, oh, there is no creative industries in Uzbekistan. No, there is. It has been developing. It has been existing. It's just no one actually get, gave the definitive kind of understanding of what it is. So it's, uh, in my understanding as a government institution, it doesn't matter if the government will or will not support this area. It will exist anyways, but what the government can do, we can just uh, kind of push it and make this development happen faster. So we can provide uh, different um, policy uh, interventions. We can provide the access to kind of um, uh, business tools. We can ease the procedures for um, legal and uh, other forms of registration of the businesses. And we see the World Conference on Creative Economy as a kind of a tool for us and a way of creating this roadmap that will allow us to have Uzbekistan on the creative map of the world and uh, tell the world that we have a lot to share, we have a lot of experience in this, and uh, we see ourselves as being able to kind of integrate something culturally important for the world scene, and at the same time uh, gain a lot of experience from our foreign um, partners who will be also uh, participating in this conference. Um, so nowadays we are working closely with the with UNCTAD, we are in contact with our Indonesian colleagues in order to understand which direction specifically we want to take for our country because as most of you probably know, the World Conference is a way um, of creating this roadmap and affecting this roadmap by integrating the cultural, um, um, the cultural um, how do you say it, the cultural key aspects of each country. So if for some country it's tourism, for another one it's food, it's, for us it's also another sector which is very important. So in this sense I would like to show a short video, if it's possible you could turn it on. Um, it's very short so I'm still within my limits. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Um, so yes, yeah, so uh, what you can see from this video is uh, it kind of represents what we envisioned for the roadmap, for our own roadmap. So we see that there is a lot of crafts, there is a lot of cultural um, aspects like traditions that we have, and we see creative industries as a tool of developing these areas. Um, as as my colleague told just, just now, uh, there are so many um, craftsmen, there are so many people who do something with hands, but they don't know how to accelerate their business skills. So we see this uh, conference as an opportunity to create these uh, practical um, steps towards that. Um, so yeah, this is the um, very short kind of uh, uh, plan that we have for now in order to move on to the main activity that we will have in September 2024, uh, for which I, will ho I hope that uh, most of you will join. So, of course, it's the uh, identifying the key definition of the creative industries within Uzbekistan and in Central Asia as a whole. Um, also, uh, create the activities that will, um, that will help us to, uh, to have practical development of creative industries, uh, create the fr um, community of the friends of creative economy, identify the uh, champions and ambassadors in that field. Um, also, um, the field that could culturally represent uh, the creative industries and many others. So, um, what I would, uh, I would really hope for is uh, these kind of initiatives, they will help us you know, to get more networking and uh, we would be really open to any suggestions, any partnerships, whoever wants to help us achieve this goal in 2024. And, and yes, if there are any questions, I'm here for you. So thank you thank so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, again, if you have questions, you know where to go and how to do it by now. Thank you so yes. much uh, for your presentation. Now, I want to turn to you, Kairat Sadvakaso, Deputy Chairman, Kazakh Tourism. Thanks, Elif. Good afternoon, everybody. Can I have a clicker, please? Yeah. Yes, sure. Um, it is. Yes. yes, there you go. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, British Council, first of all, for putting together such a great event. Thanks for having me here. Well, uh, Based on my attire, I guess you already guessed I'm a government official, just like Ramil mentioned, except for my socks probably, so trying to be <laughs> creative here. Um, you know what, listening to all of our colleagues here, I realize we're kind of following the same path. We're experiencing the same issues, the same challenges, and uh, similarly with uh, Azerbaijan or with Uzbekistan, there are the same aspirations, I guess, we're hoping to achieve same uh, endeavors, but we have several, uh, I guess, local nuances, local aspects that are a little bit different. So before I start, before I jump into my presentation, I'd like to honor the host country. I'm sure you know uh, Korkut, Korkut Ata, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, all the Turkic world. You know this uh, ancient poet, philosopher who lived back in the 10th century. So he was uh, struggling the whole of his life trying to crack the secret of immortality. So he gave up at the end and came up to a conclusion that the only thing that will help you to stay immortal is through serving people through arts. So I think this is very crucial in uh, our Turkey cultures and I guess across the world because it's a, such a universal language that we all share. And, uh, one of the reasons why uh, we tapped into, creativ into creativity, into creative industries so late, comparing to, let's say, Georgia. For instance, uh, we are probably at the stage where Georgia was back in 2017, based on what Elena was sharing with us. But uh, one of the reasons is because, I guess, we are the closest country out of former, all of the former USSR, country, USSR countries to Russia, and we had a greater influence comparing to Uzbekistan or Azerbaijan, so we, are, we have been preoccupied with actually reviving our own culture, our own languages, religions, and so on, because back in the day, 30 years, 40 years ago, we were quite suppressed in, in terms of uh, when it came to experiencing our uh, religion, our, uh, using our language on a daily basis, and so on. So um, I guess uh, now it's the right time, so uh, it's never too late. So. We're here right now embracing creative industries, and here's the state of affairs uh, as of 2020. 
that's uh, the most recent complete data that I can share with you as of now. Uh, over the past four years, 2016 through 2020, creative economy generated 2 billion US dollars, and we're looking at 52 different types of economic activities. Okay, surprisingly, 18% of all the types of economic activity yield the highest tax receipts, 80%. So the leaders are arts, architecture, and IT. We have around 300,000 people employed, but just like Daniel mentioned, I'm sure there are more people because 80% of the people in, engaged in the industry are freelancers. A lot of people are kind of in the shadow, in the gray economy. So the total output right now, the input into GDP is around 3%. But once again, we believe it's a little bit more. But the good thing, creative industries, if we look at the gross value add, it is growing much, much faster than the, the, the average across other industries. So one of the interesting facts that out of almost 40,000 different uh, SMEs registered or uh, labeled as creative economies, they are working in Almaty, which is the former capital of Kazakhstan, one of the biggest metropolises of the country. But out of the variety, out of all these 52 different types of activities, the government has been recognizing only two industries, or two sectors, I should say, in the creative industries. One of them is being IT or ICT, and the other one is film industry. So if you look at the, the Astana IT Hub, which is located in the capital, in a beautiful area, um, occupying 22,000 square meters, great spaces. So this IT Hub is offering a special tax regime and spe special visa regime for IT workers, offering unprecedented tax incentives, completely zero waived taxes for corporate, for uh, individual income tax, social tax, or uh, what, whatsoever. So over the three years that they've been <coughs> existing, the, the IT Hub helped to save 51 million US dollars in taxes for this 800 plus uh, companies working now uh, in uh, Stan Almaty or the city of Karaganda because uh, it, it's kind of uh, uh, ex-territorial arrangement. So you don't have to be present in Astana, but you can register with the hub and keep working in other destination. The other sector is film industry. So these two industries, having said that they've been recognized with the government, they have proper, more or less proper infrastructure. They have a separate law. They have some rebate or tax incentives. So with film industry, it's mostly in Almaty. We have uh, Kazakh film, a studio which was relocated during World War II uh, back in 1940s and um, it's a nice area in the city center occupying 14 point half hectares area with uh, two full-fledged uh, film studios uh, then it's Kazakh cinema which is essentially a foundation that provides funding for so-called national films which either somehow depict uh, the history of Kazakhstan or race, patriotism, and so on. And we do have a less informal uh, semi-private fund, Salem Social Media. Salem means high in, uh, in Kazakh language. Um, uh, very popular, just like Aloha or Namaste. So very catchy in Kazakhstan. And it, it's a less formal fund offering pre pretty much uh, the same amount of funding, but uh, mostly for digital series, for other types of shows. It doesn't have to be patriotic. It has to be uh, very catchy and uh, easy to sell. So this uh, platform managed already to sell some of, the, some of their products to, uh, to uh, streaming platforms in Russia and in Korea. And as kind of a segue to uh, filming industry, and th this is to the issue of trying to find our own niche, we realized that uh, Kazakhstanis are really good in uh, actions. I guess that's uh, a tribute to our uh, nomadic past. Uh, we've been warriors for so many years. We've been uh, very good in uh, equestrian kind of techniques, and uh, a lot of people are really fond of martial arts. We're not good in group sports. Like, you, you don't see a Kazakh team playing in uh, higher leagues of uh, basketball or hockey or uh, even football. 
but you see a lot of UFC fighters, uh, we have a lot of uh, boxing Olympic champions and so on. And I think my uh, colleagues from USSR would attest because uh, it was kind of a, a big narrative for men back in the day to be in, engaged in martial arts. So a lot of these people, I mean, uh, th there's only one Conor McGregor and probably not all of them will succeed. But uh, what do they have to do? 20, 30 years ago, they would be either teachers of physical training at school or they would join mafia or, or both sometimes. <laughs> but uh, things have changed. So what do they do? Probably they should go and do some stunts. So we have this nice uh, examples, Action Studio Kundo and uh, Nomad Stunts. So Nomad Stunts, uh, they help to set this actions and uh, different scenes for battle scenes for Mulan movie in 2020, uh, Marco Polo BBC series, 47 Ronin, and uh, other uh, award winning movies. So we really think it's a niche that we have to follow. Uh, another kind of uh, spin off from the, uh, from the filming industry. You know, TikTok is such an obsession in the country. 64, it generates only in Kazakhstan, 64. 0.5 billion views on TikTok, Kazakhstan alone. 36 new uh, videos uploaded only from Kazakhstan on a monthly basis. Uh, and that's all from TikTok data. And uh, Kazakh Kazakhstani people spend one and a half hours in TikTok daily. That's the official data from TikTok. I mean, it's such an obsession and we cannot help but embrace this. So you see Ministry of Education officially onboarding TikTok in its educational programs. And what we did, we were working with TikTok Academy, and uh, we were throwing just this month uh, this uh, educational platform. And we engaged movie um, uh, celebrities from Kazakhstan to actually teach them online via TikTok. And then they would do uh, their homework, post it on TikTok. And based on that, it's kind of a challenge we will um, select the winners and then do mm -hmm. some real projects and filming with them. Sir, so. I, I hate to be this person really? and interrupt it's a very already. interesting okay. presentation, so, but your time is actually uh, up. So yeah. Okay. Uh, so just very briefly, uh, apart from that, we're trying ourselves in digital fashion. We have uh, uh, some people that already uh, partook in uh, New York uh, film, uh, sorry, New York fashion uh, week or placed their characters on the NFT time marketplace, of course, artisans and handicrafts, they are trapped in cross-sectoral or intersectoral misunderstanding because when it comes to actually making something with their own hands, it's ministry of, let's say, uh, light production. And when it comes to selling, it's ministry of trade. And when it comes to selling to tourists, it's ministry of culture and sports and tourism. So uh, we're trying to help them, of course, with different uh, contests and capacity building. And just recently, one of the cities in the south was enlisted to World Craft Citizen uh, 2022. And uh, basically our vision is to come up with a foundation just like with Uzbekistan to help to search for talents, to accelerate them and get them ready for exports. And of course, when it comes to financing mechanisms, that's one of the issues we were experiencing. We would like to create a state-owned venture capital fund. And uh, speaking of creative hubs, that's one of the challenges of creative industries. We'd like to convert uh, former industrial plants that are no longer intact or some cultural buildings or convention centers into creative hubs. This uh, particular building, a pyramid, was designed by Sir Norman Foster from the UK and uh, it's a convention center. We'd like to convert this into a creative hub too. So our next steps are legal issues. You have to identify what creative industries are. We've been struggling with uh, deputies of parliaments, fighting on what it actually is. Every beaver is an engineer, as you know. So there was a huge dispute whether it's a product of uh, intellectual property or, for, or mm -hmm. creative uh, activities and so on. So uh, we're into the stage next year on, we'll have a foundation, uh, a separate act on uh, creative industries. And that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for your awesome. attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're now two minutes uh, into uh, your time, I guess, but you have your presentation, Luisa Moros, Ministry of Culture and Information Policy of Ukraine. Now the floor is yours. Curious to hear what you have to say. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Luisa and I have been working at the Ministry of Culture and Information Policy of Ukraine for almost 
five years. And um, I have seen the boom of creative industries and their institutions. I have seen a pandemic crisis and post-pandemic recovery. And creative industries, despite all the troubles, have always been there supporting, encouraging, inspiring and comforting us. Through thick and thin, they have been making Ukraine uh, a more vibrant, colorful, peaceful and European country to live in. However, the war changed everything. In 2014, when uh, Russians occupied a Ukrainian city of, Don of Donetsk, they took a, a large creative hub, Izolatia, isolation, and turned it into torturing facilities, into a prison. There is another uh, event recently that really struck me. So in 2022, when, Russian, when Russians retreated from Bucha, it's a town not far from Kiev, the capital, they mined a piano of a uh, 10-year-old girl so they did it deliberately with a cold ha head. They put a mine inside. They arranged the awards uh, back, knowing that it was a, a room of a small girl. Um, luckily, parents, when they were back, they noticed that the order of um, the awards was different and the catastrophe, catastrophe was prevented, but only this time. In all other occupied territories of Ukraine, um, everything that is creative is being destroyed right now. So the full-scale invasion jeopardized the very existence of creative industries in Ukraine. It killed them where Russia remained stayed for too long. And I believe that creative industries can survive the toughest economic crisis but there is one thing that eradicates them totally, and that is the absence of freedom. Because freedom is the key to creativity, innovation, competition, and therefore creative industries cannot exist in autocratic country. So there is only one way to ensure the future of creative industries in Ukraine, to save the war, to, to, to win the war, and to secure Ukraine's freedom. And our creative industries in Ukraine understand it perfectly well, and they have been participating in the national resistance since the first days of the full-scale invasion. First, they are the medium a very important medium to convey Ukrainian messages and narratives to foreign audiences and share the truth through memes, uh, videos, designs, songs and other creative content. This military conflict is called a smartphone war because our military success and the assistance provided by our allies largely depends on our information success. So there have been a lot of um, grassroots self-organized initiatives uh, that are producing actually this creative content and for, for example our minister, Ministry of Defense uses some of the memes in their official Twitter account to mock Ukrainian, uh, to mock Russian uh, soldiers. International campaign Be Brave Like Ukraine, visits of Hollywood stars to Ukraine and the release of some of the Azovstal prisoners couldn't have been possible without the efforts of our creative professionals. So Ukraine is winning this social media war. We also have um, an IT army, more than 200,000 uh, common users, common Ukrainians, helping to take down Russian digital infrastructure and financial services. Second, creative industries keep working and exporting even in the darkest hour, even during the uh, blackouts. For example, during the first eight months of 2022, uh, IT experts uh, has increased by 23% as compared to the same period uh, last year. Also, creative businesses started producing items for our Ukrainian army, uh, such as like uniforms, army boots, and even um, bulletproof vests. 
And such projects as spent with Ukraine and made with bravery encourage foreign audience to, to buy more Ukrainian good, goods and services, and they also raise funds for, for our victory. And third, many Ukrainian creative professionals have actually joined the army, and these are our best people, the smartest ones, the most talented ones, the, uh, the brightest ones, and we lose our best people. Yesterday, for example, uh, Vadim Klupianets, who was an artist in the National Operetta Theatre of Ukraine, died. He was uh, 26 years old, and he was a, a creative professional, and he, he died. And uh, Pan Ukraine updates the list of people of culture taken away by the war, and that's the most painful thing to look at. Before the full-scale invasion, creative industries in Ukraine were a dynamic sector that amounted to 4.2% of our GDP. But when invasion started, the total number of taxpayers in creative industries decreased by 60%, and the declared income dropped by 41%. 37% of creative professionals lost their jobs. Revenues that are lost due to the uh, disruption of the value-added chains in creative industries uh, amount to $1 billion monthly. So brain drain, stagflation, and disruption of all the ch chains that's, uh, that are the problems, that are the issues that we are facing right now. And um, at the same time, the state budget was uh, reallocated to support the army. So we were in a situation when uh, we didn't have uh, enough funds to support specifically our creative industries. Of course, there were certain schemes to provide immediate financial assistance to uh, unemployed. Uh, workers, including in creative se sectors, but it was not enough. So close cooperation with development partners is one of the main ideas that underpins a Ukraine's recovery plan. And there were two main priorities at the beginning, to preserve employment and to help creative businesses to resume their activity, to keep working and producing creative goods and services. And uh, our international partners helped us by providing grants, immediate financial assistance, scholarships, um, and direct equipment support, and also uh, study opportunities and residences for Ukrainian creatives um, abroad. So as you can see, there are many parties to the Ukrainian recovery plan that are already uh, implementing necessary measures. So it's not a purely governmental plan. And the level of cooperation between uh, international donators and uh, the Ukrainian cultural sector is decentralized and really horizontal. Uh, but in the long term, the trajectory, the Ukrainian recovery trajectory, needs to be focused on economic uh, liberalization. But currently, as you can see, the Ukraine's recovery plan is also very uh, dynamic. So currently there is a debate and discussion on how exactly this economic liberalization should look like in terms of uh, tax policies, labor policies, monetary policies. Um, and these policies should take into account Ukraine's future accession to the European Union and the increased um, governmental spending during and after the war. However, whatever the uh, liberalization path of Ukraine looks like, the working group identified main uh, pillars to um, help Ukrainian creative industries uh, to recover and grow. So these are uh, pillars like leverages to which we can apply our resources and like, amplify the effect. And one of the first pillars, very important one, is education, because we are losing our people and there is brain drain, but also our creative professionals accessed new markets when the war started, so it requires new competencies. And education is crucial in this process. So we've been thinking about schemes for establishing closer ties between universities and creative businesses, 
about uh, boosting the entrepreneurial skills of uh, Ukrainian creative professionals, about the development of policy making skills in creative industries, and uh, the British Council was really supported in this um, regard. And in the long term, we are also thinking about launching a creative backpack program, which would allocate state funding for the trips of school students to uh, different parts of Ukraine where they can uh, get acquainted with uh, contemporary creative professions and practices. So the second very important pillar is the capacity building of our institutions. And by institutions, I don't necessarily mean like formal and official institutions. The war uh, has shown that the cultural landscape of Ukraine is very diverse. We have a lot of NGOs, creative hubs, emergency schemes, local and regional um, agencies, and they are really close to the markets. They, they know their markets and they can help them without, um, with less bureaucratic burden. And they have shown amazing resilience under pres present circumstances. And this like, resilience should be um, strengthened and their capacity should be enhanced like, during and after the war. So we are talking about um, um, project management, financial management, grant management, um, government relations, digitalization, cross-sectoral cooperations with these institutions to, to, uh, to build their capacity, improve their capacity. But also it's important to, um, uh, regarding our formal institutions that were deprived of state funding since the beginning of the war, such as the Ukrainian Cultural Foundation, uh, the Ukrainian Book Institute, it's also <coughs> important to keep the, them going because institutionalization is the key to success when it comes to creative industries. Third, we're talking about targeted instruments for businesses to address possible um, market asymmetries and market failures. Uh, targeted instruments that would, have, that would be tied to particular key performance indicators. So we have uh, a special package in mind that would include, for example, reimbursement of rental expenses for Ukrainian creative enterprises, such as fashion and design brands in malls, in shopping centers. We're thinking about grant support for Ukrainian stands and booths at the international uh, fairs and exhibitions and events, um, about support in establishing new business supply and demand chains, such as like export promotion, trade missions, B2B meetings and platforms that would help them to assess, uh, to, to access new markets in a more effective manner. Uh, and finally, a grant support for R&D, innovation, high tech in creative industries and also cross sectoral projects because creative industries, as we believe, will also be important in, uh, in our collective mental health and well-being after, after the war. There is another important pillar, which is like infrastructure. So at the moment, there are more than 500 cultural facilities destroyed by Russian attack in Ukraine. And of course, they should be re rebuilt, reconstructed. But we also need to build new cultural sites, such as creative hubs, such as concert halls, to create a more sustainable setting for creative industries development. Before the war, we did the research with the Kiev School of Economics that has shown that when we invest in uh, infrastructure, so capital investment are more effective than investment in consumption. So the um, multiply is, uh, is much bigger in this case. Uh, so it's important that investments in infrastructure, they not only um, are relevant in economic terms, but they also create spaces for the exchange of ideas and they're important in, 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 in a content creation sense. And finally, it is very important for Ukraine to continue the internalization and globalization of the Ukrainian culture, given the fact that we have now a lot of creative professionals abroad that establish new partnerships that create content uh, in cooperation with uh, their foreign counterparts. Um, so diaspora culture, collaboration of the Ukrainian creatives with foreign artists, digitalization and translation of the Ukrainian creative content are crucial to make 
uh, our cu culture available in, in foreign, to, to foreign audiences. So I think that creative industries confirm the civilization path that Ukraine has chosen because creative industries can exist only in a free country. And creative industries and their situation right now show that Ukrainians are fighting for their culture, for their state, for their identity, but at the same time for the fundamental uh, human norms and values. And we cannot fight alone. We need your help. So help us to promote Ukrainian culture and creative industries abroad, buy Ukrainian uh, goods and services, spend with Ukraine, call your Ukrainian partners and ask them whether they need assistance with uh, supply, logistics, manufacturing and other aspects and add any targeted uh, donation to support particular cultural initiatives would also be much appreciated. So today and tonight specifically, it's high time for policymakers in culture and in economy all over the world to show commitment to the true meaning of creative industries, namely the measure of freedom and democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Moros, for this um, moving presentation. I'd like to say now, very quickly, we're moving on to uh, the questions, and um, I will try to take a few of them, if time permits a little bit more. Uh, now, uh, the question that is the most popular is to you, Marina. How do you select artists in Uzbekistan whom you support? Are your programs widely advertised and accessible to all who qualify? Um, specifically for the artists, um, as I mentioned, we, uh, we did launch this laboratory for the young artists two years ago. So the laboratory under the Center for Contemporary Arts, it's been, um, it's been working for two years now. Each year, the curatorial team of the laboratory changes so that we, um, we try to, it's, it's usually a group of 20 different artists, 20, from 20 to 25. And what we do not require from them is to have a specific artistic education or a specific uh, academic background in the fields of arts. These are the people who have the passion to grow, they have the passion to learn, they have admissions. So we've been promoting them within different kind of projects that we've held. Uh, we do work with the artists from Uzbekistan, specifically we've done, uh, in 2019, we launched the first exhibition in a pilot mode in the Center for Contemporary Arts of Sadat Ismailova, who is very well known abroad. Uh, we also worked with, we, we also work with local artists. We very recently made a kind of a domestic, um, but very nice initiative with the young artists in the 139 documentary related to the ecology problems. So we do work a lot with young artists and it doesn't really depend on whether they are um, with a name, whether they are well known or not, because we envision ourselves as the kind of, we, we have the mission to support the artists who are emerging, not specifically with a big name and not specifically with the academic background because they need that support. Mm -hmm. And uh, being a foundation, not only a government institution, uh, but also as a foundation that uh, we are not specifically as the Ministry of Culture, we have kind of more capacity and more um, opportunities to, for example, if the Ministry of Culture cannot participate at the fair, we can. So we can promote the young artists, we can um, provide, their, provide them with our contacts, with, uh, so we can mm -hmm. uh, anyhow you know, help them and support them domestically and abroad as well. Thank you. Another question that is becoming very popular is to Luisa. How can we, as your fellow neighbor policymakers, 
support Ukraine in your recovery trajectory for the creative industries coming from Emre Erbilar. Okay, if you want to have a specific like and direct project, uh, you can contact me because we have a lot of um, projects and initiatives currently going on. But I'd say that from your uh, place and position nowadays, it would be really great if you could keep uh, promoting Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian creative industries abroad, establishing partnerships with uh, your Ukrainian counterparts, um, because that shows Ukraine in the world, not just you know as a victim that suffered from the war, but as a very uh, unique culture with its original creative industries. And that's the message that we want to, to convey to, to the world. And of course, you can always donate to um, United24. That's our national fundraising platform. Um, and later, these uh, funds are distributed to, to the like, most urgent needs, including in, in cultural sphere. Uh, but again, there are a lot of, a lot of opportunities from um, spreading the Ukrainian co content uh, directly and immediately to like, more elaborated options, communicating with your partners. If you have some specific projects in mind, we are open to, to discuss it. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I think I will be getting one last question, or at most two. One last question, let's say. Um, so how can Central Asian governments work together to accelerate progress, given lots of challenges are the same? Um, why don't I direct this question to you? Thank you. You, you know, if we look even uh, to prehistoric times, it always took a third party or a third country to have Central Asian states work together. Back in the Silk Road times, it was China and Iran. So we were kind of an intermediary between, on, on this uh, ancient uh, trade route. Later on, it was, uh, as you all know, Russia that put us together in the Soviet Union. So we were working together B because be before or in between, we we're always fighting. Uh, so it was, uh, very uh, difficult challenge, and I think we're still experiencing this now. We're no longer fighting, but it's some sort of a competition happening, and uh, every time I get a chance, I, when we speak to international donors and uh, organizations, I tell them, hey, uh, USA, why, why don't you uh, initiate this uh, joint uh, branding program between Central Asian states, because otherwise it's not happening. I'll give you a great example. Uh, JICA, uh, Japanese uh, Devel International Development Program, uh, united us together under one pavilion at the Japan T Tourism Forum in September. And the only condition was all the five stands, five countries, you come together under one umbrella of the Silk Road. And you, we give you for free the pavilion and everything else, the booths. So it worked out really well. So. Uh, I guess we still need uh, someone uh, from, from outside to help us work together, but uh, uh, I think we do have all this potential. It's a high time to really start, and uh, we work with Uzbekistan on, num in, on numerous tourism-related initiatives, such as uh, Silk Road Transborder Tour. We've, we finally work with Kyrgyzstan on a um, hiking tour connecting Big Almaty Lake and Istikul Lake, which is a three, four days tour across beautiful gorges of Tian Shan Mountains. And uh, I guess the first creative industries project that should uh, unite us will be the World Crafts uh, Creative Industries Forum in 2024. So we are happy to start working on that one. Very good. Okay. May I also respond to this? Sure, this of question? course. Uh, Azerbaijan is not a Central Asian, Asian state, but I think. Uh, it's important to note that we are actually witnessing a, a very uh, different uh, like period of time when there is a new normal which is being actually designed in our region uh, in general. And uh, all these things that are happening in a wider region are interconnected, what is happening in Ukraine, uh, what is going on in our states. I think that we are going to the... To the uh, to, uh, to find ourselves in some years 
uh, in, a, in a position where we have to rel uh, rely on ourselves uh, and our join our forces uh, to um, actually develop in many kind, many terms and also in creative industries. I think what we have to do in terms of regional development, we have to <coughs> find out and design new platforms that unite our countries. And countries that are here, I think we have to uh, work out and also um, uh, cooperate uh, on different levels. I think from political point of view, uh, there is a strong, strong willingness to cooperate. And also we have to uh, from take, this, take the uh, businesses and also take people-to-people uh, -people contacts out of this political will and uh, bring new platforms, new chances for our industries and also creative industries to cooperate. And in this regard, I'm personally also from would like to thank the British Council, which is uh, learning with us and uh, which is making us learn and which, which is, I think, learning together with us uh, and supporting all of our countries in, in this endeavor, uh, which is very important. And I think that we are in a, in a, in a good, in the right track. Thank you. Thank you. I guess that is a good note to end it with. Uh, and the conversation, I believe, is coming in full circle because I, I am reminded and I believe we're all reminded of once again about the nature of uh, the creative industries here. Many challenges of these countries are the same. However, uh, of course, there are context-specific issues as well that you have to come up with your own solutions. So again, an another um, uh, stress on local, national and international policies. They're all needed. They're they're all, um, you know, interwoven together. They go hand in hand, and they need to be in harmony. Is I guess the bottom line here uh, at this final session we had. Thanks so much to all of you for your very valuable words. As I perhaps have you back uh, on your seats, and we get ready for the keynote session because we're finishing off today very soon.